Ray and Debbie, good to see you all here today. Debbie, you especially. Gene, great to see you here. Tommy, it's also <laughs> great to see you here. Couldn't help myself. I, I seriously considered jumping up here. <laughs> then I thought better of it. Yeah. <laughs> you should have. Pray with me, please. Father, we're so grateful for another day of life, for your love. And Father, it provides everything that we need. We pray that you'll be with Todd as he brings us a lesson. Father, we pray you'll give him the words that we might understand and make application to our lives. It's through Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Bob. Good morning, church. God is good. And all the time. You know, it doesn't happen very often, but occasionally somewhere in the world arises a report of a plane crash. So when this happens, those of us who, who, who really enjoy flying, we get a little nervous. So the officials, they want to know what, what happened. Why did that crash occur? And when they want to know why the, the crash occurred, when they want to understand what happens, the officials look for that one thing that will tell them. Right? Yes. Yes, the data recorder, what's commonly known as the black box. Now the most interesting thing about a black box well, the thing I find most interesting is the fact that it's orange. <laughs> I looked all over the web for a picture of a black box. They're all orange. <laughs> I don't know. I don't get it. Anyway, the black box itself is indestructible, which has also been curious to me. Because if you can make the box indestructible, you know, to record the destruction of the plane, then why don't you just make the plane out of the black stuff, right? Or the orange stuff, right? Make the plane out of the black box stuff. Again, I don't really get it. But the black box, its purpose is to record everything, right? The entire story of the plane, how it started, what went wrong, what we can learn from that. What was happening? What, what decisions were made? How did something that started off so well end up turning out going so poorly? Well, this week we come to chapter 13 of the story. And as we discussed last week, we, we now come to a king of Israel named King Solomon. And King Solomon, he crashed, if you will. And this morning we're going to look at, at the black box of his story to see why something that started off so well ended up going so poorly. So as we talked last week, Solomon was the son of King David. And at the end of David's reign, David passes his throne to his son Solomon. Now we read about Solomon's story in our Bibles in the books of 1 Kings and Ecclesiastes and some in the Proverbs. And everything started out well for Solomon. But in the end, everything fell apart. But fortunately for us, Solomon writes down much of this in, this, in these books. What I'm going to refer to him from now on as the black box of Solomon. So that we can learn what went wrong and we can avoid a similar kind of crash. So that's what we're going to consider this morning. But before we do that, will you join me in prayer? Father God, we thank you this morning for your goodness. We've sung about it together, thank you Chip, we've gathered around it, and now we seek to gather it from your word this morning, God, so that we can carry it in our lives. And God, I pray this morning for all of us here that we might feel a sense of your presence coming from your word, that you will draw us nearer to you, God, and that you'll give us a glimpse of your reality this morning. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray this prayer, and the church said, Amen. So I want to ask you this morning, have you ever been in a situation where you were in over your head? Have you ever been over your head? I mean, maybe you're there today. Well, in Solomon's story, this is exactly where he begins. You see, David, his father, has now died and Solomon's made king. And, and, and get this for a second. Solomon's maybe 12 or 13 or 14 years old, maybe 15, but I'm going, to go with, I'm going to go with 12. And I have to say, if I remember back to my time when I was 12, I couldn't imagine being president of the United States. Talk about being in over our heads. We would have all been over our heads had I been president of the United States at age 12. 
But that was Solomon's reality. Now, it was believed that Solomon had many advisors around him to, to help him in those early years. And Solomon's story, it does start out well, even though he's young, because God appears to him. And when God appears to him, Solomon, he fully understands he's in over his head. So, this is what Solomon says, the scripture that Mike read for us this morning. You can find this on page 177 of the story if you have it, but you can also find it in 1 Kings 3. If you'd like to read along with me. And Solomon says this, he says, I'm only a little child. And I want to belabor that point a little farther because Solomon's not being humble. He's not afraid. He says this because he's legitimately a little child, 12 years old. He says, I'm only a little child and I, I do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you've chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or number. So God, please give your servant, give me a discerning heart to govern your people, to distinguish between right and wrong. For who's able to govern this great people of yours? So, so God, he, he appears to Solomon, and Solomon humbly asks for wisdom. Solomon started out good, and God grants him the ability to distinguish between right and wrong. And because Solomon asked for wisdom and he didn't ask for things of this world, God gave him something else. He promised Solomon wealth, and he promised Solomon a long life because Solomon's heart was one of servanthood. Now our story moves along and Solomon gets a little older, and the things start to change a little bit. You see, Solomon starts to pursue happiness, worldly happiness. And if we were to look throughout all the entire Bible and we were to ask which person in the Bible is the closest cultural equivalent to the average American today, I don't know, I would make the argument that it would have to be Solomon. Because you see, Solomon sought worldly happiness. And isn't that what the average person in our society today seeks? What are those sayings? If you have an itch, scratch it. If you have a desire, go for it. And that's how Solomon began to live his life. The big difference is Solomon had all the resources in the world to make it happen. So Ecclesiastes goes on and it tells us that Solomon tried many things to find happiness. Laughter, drunkenness, folly. He built houses for himself. He built vineyards for himself. He built reservoirs. He bought slaves. He bought herds. He amassed more silver and gold than anyone else ever before him. He bought singers, both male and female. Why he would do that, I have no idea, Chip. But he did. He had harems. But in the end, none of this, absolutely none of this, brought him happiness. As a matter of fact, in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, Solomon went on to say this about his time, or this time in his life. In verse 10, when he said, I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my labor, and, and this was the reward for all my toil. Yet, when I surveyed all that my hands had done, and all that I had achieved, everything was meaningless. Everything was a chasing after the wind, and nothing was gained under the sun. You see, Solomon had everything, but none of it brought him happiness. Yet there were other things he collected beyond what I've listed here. As a matter of fact, Solomon was most famously known for one other thing that he collected. That's right, Deborah. Wives. The man liked to collect wives. Now, get this. 700 wives. Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. And I'm not the wisest person in the world, but I think I could have told Solomon, 700 wives is not going to make you happy, right? <laughs> it's just not going to work. Yet Solomon kept, he kept thinking, well, maybe this one. Maybe this one. Maybe this one. And it was all this pursuit of happiness through multiple wives that, well, it ultimately brings Solomon down. Solomon. 
In 1 Kings chapter 11, it says this, King Solomon, however, he loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter, Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, Hittites. They were from nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them. Why? Because they will surely turn your hearts after their gods. Nevertheless, Solomon had held fast to them in love. So, so, so God gives clear instructions on marriage. You must not intermarry with them. Because if you do, they'll turn your hearts after other gods. God says, don't do this. But it's interesting, right? Because here's the very next word that we read in Scripture. Right after God says, don't do this. The very next word in Scripture is, is nevertheless nevertheless even though god gave clear instruction on marriage solomon's black box includes nevertheless and nevertheless was when solomon and 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 frankly church it's when we trust the wisdom of us over the wisdom of god here you have solomon who early on said god i want to have wisdom I want to be able to discern the difference between right and wrong. And then just a little further down the line, Solomon starts thinking, you know what? I'm pretty successful. I'm pretty wise. I'm a little smarter than you are, God. God gave Solomon clear instruction, but nevertheless. So I want to pause here for a moment, and I want to ask you all a question. Do you have a nevertheless in your life is there something that god has clearly instructed you on but you think you know better and maybe maybe we start thinking that god's instructions a little antiquated maybe god's instructions a little out of date have you heard that before you know what it was relevant back then two thousand years ago or four thousand years ago But you know what? It's really not that relevant today because our culture is just different today. And that's exactly what Solomon thought. Which leads me to a statement I'm going to make, and you may find it a little harsh, but church, that one thing on the other side of your nevertheless, well, we could say that's your God, right? We could say that we know the God of the Scriptures, and, 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 and we, we, the God of the Scriptures is our God. But really, the way that we know the God of the Scriptures is our God is that we're willing to follow the wisdom that we asked for. You know, we ask for God to show us the way. We ask for God to teach us the way. And the wisdom of God is then shown by our willingness to follow His direction. Solomon His response to God's direction was nevertheless. Nevertheless, Solomon held fast to these women. Church, do you have anything in your life where God's instructed you? Nevertheless, you're going to hold fast to that thing that God's instructed against? Well, in 1 Kings chapter 11, it goes on to say this. Solomon had 700 wives of royal birth. And 300 concubines. And his wives, they did. They led him astray. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods. And his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God, as was the heart of David, his father. He followed Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. So so Solomon did evil. In the eyes of the Lord, Solomon did not follow the Lord completely as David, his father, had done. So God, in his clear, he was clear in his instruction on marriage, but before Solomon's time, but also in direct conversation with Solomon. But Solomon, he thought he was wiser than God. And there's one thing I have to admit about Solomon, and I'm going to admit the same thing about me. As a matter of fact, I'm going to admit the same thing about most of us men, right? A little generalization here. You know what, us men, we just don't think that instructions 
are intended for us. Right? We just give no credence to instructions. Let me, let me give you an example. All right, man, prepare yourselves. So how many of you have you ever bought something like the gas grill that I bought recently? And when you open up the box, the first thing you see, you pull the cardboard open, is a set of instructions. And you also see a, a, a cardboard backpack with about 200 nuts, bolts, and washers. And what's the first thing we do? Right? We grab the instructions, we throw it to the side, and we rip open the package of nuts, bolts, and washers. Why? Because I got this. Right? I know better. I mean, how hard can this be? And, and honestly, right, instructions are for losers. That's my statement, and I'm sticking with it. I mean, how can you not know how to put a bolt into a washer, into a screw? Nevertheless, right? Nevertheless. In church, I think that's what many of us do when it comes to our sex life, our marriage life, our love life. God says, here's how this works. Here's how I've designed this. And yet, we think we know better. Nevertheless. And that's exactly what Solomon does. And here's how it plays out. So first, Solomon marries women from other countries, either for love or sex or political deal-making. And the problem with this wasn't really an ethnicity problem. But church, it was an idolatry problem. Let me explain. You see, God says specifically, don't marry these women because they'll turn your heart away from me. Because these women worship not the God of Solomon, but false gods. And you might be thinking to yourself, why is God so jealous of these other gods? Because he's the God. But you have to understand something about these other gods to know why God was saying this. So let me give you a few examples. The Moabites, they worshipped the god of Chemosh, who required child sacrifice. Babies being killed as a part of worship. And God said, no, 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 no. Don't worship them. This is a false god. The Philistines and the Sidonians, they worshipped Astrith, whose worship included ritual prostitution and the abuse and the enslavement of women. And God again says, no, 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 no. Don't do that. Don't worship this God. This is a false God. This is a God that's going to lead you to captivity. And eventually, even though these gods were much different than the God of Solomon, these wives turned Solomon towards them. Solomon was ultimately swayed towards these other gods because Solomon made the critical decision to engage in polygamy. And you know, it's interesting because oftentimes in our study today or our conversations about the Old Testament, many Christians, well, I hear this statement often, you know why? It was okay for, for, for them back then, these Christian men, to engage in polygamy. But let me tell you, it wasn't. If we were to back up in the story, back to Genesis chapter 2, God set up marriage clearly. In verse 24 of chapter 2, when he said, this is why a man leaves his father and his mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh, not 700 fleshes. You see, this is how God envisioned and created and prescribed marriage between one man and one woman from the beginning. And just because they're examples of great biblical men in the Old Testament being polygamists, that doesn't mean that it was God's preference as I was reading articles about this, there was, there was one person that said this, and I love the way he said this. He said, let's not confuse description with prescription. There's a huge difference between what God, God's Word records and what God's Word endorses. You see, there were plenty of examples of these same men pre, pre, convicting or committing other sins in the Bible. You remember last week with David and Bathsheba and Uriah? In every example of polygamy in the Old Testament, it shows us that it wasn't good. Their relationships suffered because of polygamy. And Solomon was just another perfect example. Yet Solomon decided in his pursuit of happiness that he knew more than God. 
and his heart told him this is how he could be happy. You know, it should be noted that this was not all just lust for Solomon. This was also a part of political deal-making for the richest and the most powerful man in the world. Because you see, the culture around Solomon at this time, well, it told him, this is just the norm. This is okay. God tells Solomon one thing, but culture told him another. And I would like to give Solomon the benefit of the doubt, right? But I really don't buy the argument. I I really love this woman. I think wife number 567, she's going to be the one, right? If not, maybe 568 will be a little better. And about this time, you might be saying to yourself, okay, Todd, I get it, right? Polygamy's out. I won't marry a thousand women. Or you might just be thinking, hey, Todd, polygamy is against the laws in the U.S., so, so why are you beating a dead horse? And I'd have to agree with you, right? But I want us to think for a moment. When we look at society today, what are the cultural equivalents to polygamy in today's society? Is there anything in our society today where society says, this is okay, this is good, we know better than God? What about same-sex attraction? Homosexuality? What about gender confusion? Transgenderism? Does our culture today think in its wisdom it knows better than God how women and men were designed? Does our culture today think that most traditional values just don't apply to the world we live in? Because they know better than the one who created everything. You know, there's a verse in Proverbs that speaks exactly to this mindset that is so prevalent in our world today. And it's Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 12. It's very simple. And it said, there's a way that appears to be right, but in the end, it leads to death. And you want to guess who wrote this? That's right. Solomon. Solomon. And Solomon learned it the hard way. You see, Solomon started out at the beginning of his story humbly asking for wisdom, which was granted to him. He knew what was right, and he knew what was wrong. And yet he didn't follow the wisdom that God had given him. You see, in his pride, he often acted contrary to that wisdom. And if we needed any more support about this, and I'm sure Lynn's going to talk about this today, any way more to see how Someone who started off with such humility had had got caught up in such Well, Consider the fact that it took him seven years to build the temple. Yet it took him 13 years to build his own home. And they stood right next to each other. You, You see, Solomon struggled. He struggled to follow God's wisdom, not only in his sex life, but also in his work. Which was ironic, because if you work seven days a week, why do you need so many wives? Yet Solomon thought he knew better. And by refusing to live in the wisdom that God gave him, ultimately this caught up with him, and it resulted in due time, and Gary will talk about this a little bit next week, into the kingdom being split into two. You see, for Solomon, with his heart being split, that ultimately manifested itself in his kingdom. But that's all I'm going to say about Solomon today. I'm done with Solomon. Solomon. And I'm not going to spend any more time today talking about the kind of sin that Solomon fell into with the wives and the other gods and the greed. Because frankly, we got a lot of sin talk last week, right? You got a lot of preaching about sin for me last week when we talked about David and Bathsheba. Instead, this morning, I'd like to make a little application of Solomon's story to our lives today. Not to the world, but to everyone sitting in here today. Because you know, so often, we ask God for wisdom. And we say, God, if you'd only show me the way, give me wisdom in my relationships. Give me wisdom in my work life. God, give me wisdom. And God gives us wisdom, and we say, hold on here, God. I don't really agree with that. I think I know better. I think I know more than the Ancient of Days. I think I know more than the one who's timeless. I think I know more than the one who, who right back here breathed out the stars. I know better. 
Which brings us to our one and only teaching point this morning. This teaching point comes from St. Augustine in the 5th century. I believe it's the 5th century. And it was a quote he made, and it's very, very relevant. He said this, If you believe what you like in the gospel, and you reject what you don't like, it's not the gospel you believe, but yourself. How true is that? Let me me say it again. If you believe what you like in the gospel and you reject what you don't like, it's not the gospel you believe, but it's yourself you believe. No matter how wise you are, if you think you're wiser than God's instructions in our lives, church, it'll never end up going well. And if this is the situation you find yourselves in today, church, there's no better time than right now to repent. No better time. And again, I don't want to focus on the sins of Solomon. Because as I look around this room today, I think we're a pretty grounded bunch. I'm not worried about polygamy. As I see you all out there, I'm not really worried about transgenderism or homosexuality or lust or greed or many of those sins. And I'm not saying they're not around. I'm not saying they're not prevalent. And I'm not saying they won't jump up and bite you. We talked about that last week. And church, this week, I want to focus on something different. I want to focus on and I want to challenge us to seek holiness. I want us to uh, focus on trusting what the gospel instructs us on to, to do better than just being good. And I want to encourage each and every one of us this morning to listen to the wisdom of God as He laid out these instructions for our lives. So as we wrap up chapter 13 of the story this week, I want us to focus on God's wisdom as it relates to the things we should do that we don't do instead of the things that we shouldn't do. God's wisdom tells us to spend much time in prayer. Do we do that? God's wisdom tells us to spend much time in study. Do we do that? God's wisdom tells us to spend much time in fellowship with our brothers and sisters in Christ. We probably don't do that enough. God's wisdom tells us to worship Him and Him alone with all our hearts. God's wisdom tells us to love others more than we love ourselves. God's wisdom tells us to take care of our bodies, right? It's the temple of God. God's wisdom tells us to have no other gods before Him. Either gods or things of this world. Church, when we weigh God's wisdom against our wisdom in your life, whose wisdom wins out? I mean, do you believe in the gospel? The whole gospel? Or do we believe in ourselves? Church is our God our God or is it the things of this world that's what I want you to walk out of here today and think about are we doing the things that God has given us the wisdom to understand and you may find yourself today and and you're, you're not in a great place you've never given yourself over to God you've never put on Jesus in baptism if you've never done that Let's do that today. There's no better time than right now. And you may find yourself struggling with the sins of David and Bathsheba from last week. And if you are, there's no better time to repent. We can do that right now. You can do it right where you sit. Or you may just find yourselves relying on your wisdom instead of God's wisdom and doing the things that God says we should do each and every day of our lives. And and if you find yourself in that place, there's no better time to repent than right now. You can do it right where you sit. And we want to encourage you this morning, if you need help, if you need a lift up, if you need a hand, that's what we're here for. Because we love others more than we love ourselves. If you need the prayers of this church, just let us know. And we'll pray with you each and every day. If there's anything you need to do to respond to God's call this morning, please do so while we stand and sing.